name's Dan Hughes. Uh, I'm 66 years old. Um, I'm based in Beaver Creek, Ohio. Uh, I, I basically am in a, in a period of uh, uh, change from, I've coached for 43 years um, and I will continue to coach probably in a different kind of way. Uh, it may be coaching coaches. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly where I'm at, but I'm in a period of a lot of speeches, a lot of podcasts, uh, and, and a lot of those type of things as I kind of shift into the next phase of my life. I grew up in a little town called Lowell, Ohio. It's in Southeast Ohio here. And um, I, a town of 800 people. So it was a very, very small town. Um, I was a first child, and as as we grew up, uh, I was about seven years old, and probably what led me into coaching was my my mom and dad followed a high school team. There was Fort Fry High School, and they went to the state tournament here in Ohio, and that was a big big deal for our community. Uh, and I was heavily heavily influenced by that team, uh, being seven years old and watching this experience and uh, wanting to be a player, but more than wanting to be a player, I, I wanted to coach. I knew at that moment that that's what I wanted to do. And so every step, I always had an eye on coaching. I had an eye on coaches. Uh, whatever experience I was having as a player, uh, it was deeper because I, I looked at it you know, from the standpoint of me wanting to be a coach. Um, I was fortunate. I was the first of my family to go to college. Uh, my, we did not come from a, a situation where a lot of people in my immediate family went. I'd had some cousins that had gone. But I came from a business background. Uh, my, my father and my grandfather were both very, very successful business people. And so I, I saw that, that was an example for me growing up. But the, the thing the parents did for me that was so wonderful was they let me dream my dreams. They didn't get in the way of it. You know, they didn't say, no, no, you got to run the family business. No, no, because because that could have been their approach. It was not that it, it was more like, OK, that's what you want to do. You know, we're here to to support you in doing that. So I went off to college, um, went through various stages of coaching, uh, coached men for 40 years, coached or, uh, 20 years and coached women for 23 years, coached at the high school level as a head coach, coached at the professional level um, internationally and all those things. And partially because that high school basketball team put that seed in my mind when I was seven years old, you know, to me, I, th I think it had a lot to do with teaching. I, 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 I think I am a teacher at heart. Uh, I'm a communicator at heart. You know, one of the gifts that I have, um, I think is communication. And I think I had that even as a child, uh, you know, there, there was, and I saw that as, as something that, um, uh, not only did I have the interest in sports, you know, I played basketball, I played baseball all the way through college. I, uh, you, you know, the first memory of reading anything is reading the major league baseball standings. Uh, I, I go out to get the milk. Now this is how old I am. They, they delivered milk in, in a little container. And then on top of that, oftentimes the paper boy would put the paper. So I'd go out to get the milk and I would take, the paper and I'd look at the standings and um, that's, you know, it, it allowed me to think in terms of using some of the interests I had with hopefully some of the talents that I felt I had. Um, and I, I, I just, you know, I, I deal with all kinds of people who sometimes don't decide what they're going to do till they're later. And that's absolutely fine. But that was not my journey. My journey was knowing at that moment, that's what I wanted to be. No, I, I, I wish I was a better player. Uh, in, in actuality, I think it probably made me a better coach. 
because I understood being uh, without great talents. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was a good player. I, I was a good high school player. I was on the team in college. But I didn't have exceptional gifts. I, I, I really, you know, I, you know, one of the things I do as a pro coach is always look for a talent that is very usable. For example, you know, uh, against the competition we're going to play. I'm not sure I had one. I look back at myself. I don't know. You know, my, my college coach describes me as, as somebody just kind of average, you know, uh, as a player. And, and I was. I was. But. Um, you, you don't always know how those experiences shape you when you go into empowering others and teaching others. So I had a lot of those feelings, you know, it, it, for me, I had to learn how to deal with the really truly gifted people. I was awful good at putting teams together. I was awful good at creating chemistry and culture. What I wasn't good at was understanding people with great talent and how to immerse them within that culture. And quite honestly, my wife, who's a musician, um, and I don't have any of those creative abilities from the standpoint of music, but she is a musician, but she really understood people with talents because she has one, you know, a very, very vivid musical talent. And she helped me really understand. And I think I got eventually pretty good at also understanding the talented performer because I could put teams together and I could get, make people feel very appreciated for all their different roles. Where I had to really work was the talented individual and, and, and how to put them in positions to be successful. In some cases, create a little tension with them so that they, brought out the best in them. That was really more of my journey, you know, as I look back at it now. Without doubt, it is to develop leaders as opposed to me being a leader. You know, we, we think so many times when we work with, with people, and, and I don't care what you're teaching. I don't, you know, and, and at heart, we're all teachers. But at some point, you want to develop them so they have the ability to be leaders more so than me being the leader of them. And, and that is a process, you know, that, that, that is something that, um, you know, it, 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 it's a very nurturing process so that they take ownership of themselves, of their interaction within the team, and all those things. But I think it's developing leaders and, and, and by leaders, the ability to empower others around them. You know, if somebody's really a good leader, it's not that they're just a good player. They learn how to talk and how to empower people around them and do things that make it inclusive for somebody else to feel better. And, and that's what I had to do as a coach. As I got older, I went from this single dominating presence to somebody who really used their staff, who really used their players um, in ways to allow that process, you know, and, and nurturing that, but allowing that to happen. And sometimes that's hard for a leader because they want to lead. They, they, they want to do it. But to really be most effective, we are developing leaders around us that, that create this culture that sustains itself, whether, whether we're the one doing it or someone else's. Watching the actions of others. Um, you know, actions to me speak louder than words. So when I was able to, and I'll just give you an example. Uh, in my 50s, I, I felt like I had a renaissance as a coach. You know, a lot of times people in their 50s, you are really set in what you do. You, you are very, this is what I do. This is how I do it. And all those things. Well, I landed in San Antonio, Texas to coach uh, the Silver Stars of the WNBA. And we, our owner was, was, was a gentleman by the name of Peter Holt, who also owned the Spurs. We, we were under the same umbrella. 
And so Greg Popovich is the coach of Seattle, uh, or Seattle, excuse me, San Antonio Spurs. And watching him gave me a renaissance. I learned so much. You know, I had learned from coaches I had worked with along the way, uh, many of them that was incredibly powerful to me. But being 50 and I was there 12, 13 years and watching him and watching and, and I got to know him and his staff, but it wasn't so much talking. It was just being close to the scene and watching how he handled different situations, watching how he taught, watching how he worked with various players. Um, I was really close to it, and, and that caused me to really, really learn. And learn at a time where some coaches, I think, are, you know, this is kind of how I do it, and we're tweaking it, and they're, and they're very good at it. I, I have no problem with that. But I am a, a coach that, that believes in change. I, I, I believe that you're constantly looking for a way to get better. And by viewing what Greg Popovich did, and by me having an attitude that change is not necessarily a bad thing. Change can be a very good thing, you know, uh, in how I, how, how I function and how I empower people around me and how I teach and, and how I interact with players. Um, and I allowed that influence to come into my life. Um, and I had seen great examples of that in people that, that I studied. Uh, I, I, Pat Summit, I had the ability to get to know. Um, she had that in her. As successful, as ultra successful as she was, she was open to change. She was really open to finding a better way, trying to match the talent that she had to a, a method that would lead them to a greater good. Um, and that really influenced me. That was probably the biggest thing from my relationship with Pat. And, and I didn't have a, a, a close, close, close relationship, but we knew each other. We interacted. She hired people um, that, that, that I knew, um, all those things. But that single point motivated me to allow change in my life. And sometimes it's, it's uncomfortable. But I became a, a, a much different coach in my later years than I probably did in my early years. Well, I had a lot of failure. I mean, <laughs> that's not, I mean, a lot of places I've been, I have the most wins, but I, I also have the most losses <laughs> in a lot of places. So um, I, 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 if I could give any coach or, you know, honestly, any player a, a, a talent or a quality, as important as being gifted, you know, uh, and, and having a bright mind and having a, uh, a physicality as a player that, 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 that is amazing. That's not what I'd give them. What I'd give them is persistence. What I would give them is, is the ability to understand how to keep going. That's what I'd give them. That, that's the mark to me that when I, when I see and look at people that have been successful over a long period of time, uh, you know, that take a coach and take a great mind. I, I, I don't think, I, I, you know, I don't think I have a great mind in some ways. I, I do not. Now, what I do have is a persistent mind. What I do have is I, I will find a way. And that, that is probably unmatched in most cases. And, and, and I'll give you a wonderful example. As when I recruited men, I had that same kind of personality, very, very persistent, very like that. And I usually would end up out working other assistants. I, I don't say that as a brag. I, it, it just was what I felt in me. But there was one assistant that I could not outwork. I couldn't. Well, that was Scott Drew. Now, the Baylor just won a national championship. He was at Valparaiso. I could not outwork him. Whatever I was doing, I, 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 you know, I'd be involved in the process, and I'd notice he had done that and one other thing. And as I look back, well, you know, it's no surprise to me that Scott has attained what he has attained. But, but that's, that's 
what I think is so important is that you, you have the ability to keep going. You find ways to reinvent opportunities and different things. And if you're going to be successful in any kind of endeavor, that's what I would give to you to try to develop. You know, when I came out of college, I went and got my master's degree uh, and was heavily influenced by my college coach, Jim Burson. And then my, when I got my master's, I worked for a guy named Daryl Hedrick, who meant, meant a lot to my career. So I come out trying to figure out what I should do. And, and I applied for some high school jobs as a head high school coach at 22. Well, one of them asked me that very question that you just asked me. And I sat and thought and thought about it. But, but oddly enough, what I said was I want to put people in the right spots so that they can be successful, basically was what I said. Well, you know what? I, I, I still feel the same way. Um, that, that really hasn't changed. I, I, it's my job to get people in a position where they get to their sweet spot, where they can take ownership. Uh, and it's my job, you know, sometimes I, I get out of the way because they're already on a path to that. Sometimes I have to get them, you know, and interact a little bit to do that. But I want to get them to a point where they have ownership and they become the best version of who they are and what they can do. And that's what I see my role as very poorly early. Uh, to, to be honest with you, my wife and I talked about it last night over a glass of wine, to be honest with you. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I was a very driven individual as a, a young coach, uh, young in the profession and even young when I was a professional coach. Um, I, 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 things didn't happen for me fast enough when I was young. And I think it's really important that, that you as wherever, whatever work, line of work you're in, wherever you're at, you need to invest yourself right where you are and allow the fruits of that to take you to where you want to go. You know, if you spend so much time thinking about where you want to go, you're not really here. And uh, I, I had a little bit of that, that, that I think got in my own way. You know, I had to get out of my own way in those things and, and realize, you know, uh, that if I just do a good job, probably what will follow the fruits of doing a good job will allow me to grow into some of the things that I want, you know, very much. The other thing was just dealing with officials. Um, I, I, I was bad. Uh, you know, pe people look at me and they, 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 uh, normally they think, well, he's, you know, he's a, they don't see me as a screamer and all those things per se. But uh, if I, you, you know, if I look back, I, I probably averaged five technicals a year. I got thrown out of at least one game every other year. Um, I've been thrown out eight or nine times. I've, I've paid enough fines from technicals that um, I could have bought my son a car. It, it, it's greater than that or whatever. But um, I look back and I, I, I wish I hadn't quite been that way. And as I advise other coaches and, and I, I love them to death, but I see a lot of me and them. And, and I don't know if I would have listened to it either, uh, to be honest with you. But what happened to me is when, it, when I coached in the later years, for example, the, the years at Seattle. Um, I was an older coach and I took a different path to communicate to officials that I wish I had done long before that. And part of it goes back to Brianna Stewart. Uh, there was a moment in my first year at Seattle with Stewie that I wanted to protect her. You know, they, she was getting beat around. People tried different ways to stop her and none of them were, but, but, for example, um, they were getting really physical with her. So I'm, 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 I, I all, I'm, I'm going to fight for my player, you know, to make sure that they're, they're you know, that, that the view is, is fair in my eyes with her. But anyway, I, kinda, I, I, I was kind of going over the line a little bit 
getting mad and what have you and those type of things. And, and she said to me on the bench as I was walking by, she goes, coach, we really need you, you know, to not get thrown out. We, we really need you to be on the bench. And it so impacted me. It, it, it really impacted me that she had the presence to say that to me and to realize, you know what, I need to be thinking about the game more than I'm thinking about that last call. Cause that's what I ask players to do. I ask players, if they miss a shot, you know, go to the other end and play defense. You know, that's part of the game. She was asking me to do the same thing. And, and I just wish I, I would have ascended to that moment earlier in my career uh, because you want it so bad, whether it's, to be a successful coach or whether it's to, you know, get your team playing as well as possible, but there are ways that can be way more fruitful. Uh, Humor, all kinds of things can really help that process that I learned in my later career that I wish I would have had that knowledge, or at least that uh, I would have applied that earlier. That's probably the most asked question because I, I've had a hybrid of a career. You know, I've, I've been on the men's and the women's side. So I get that question and a half for, forever. And, and the, the one thing that I always start with is there are more similarities than dissimilarities. Between, you know, players are players. I really didn't change. I, I, I didn't look and say this. Now, I, I will give you a couple observations uh, from that experience, but I will tell you players are players. And whether you're a male or you're a female. And um, what I didn't have a style that I felt had to change. I, 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 I pretty much just kept coaching in the same line. I, I hoped I moved to be a better coach, but the similarities were greater than the dissimilarities. What I noticed about women, and, and, and I'll point to two for you. Uh, one is they care more about how I coach their teammates. And I would tell people that they're they're going to be watching you when you coach your teammate, their teammate, they're interested in that. That matters to them. Now with guys, sometimes I just didn't think that mattered as much. They, they didn't, you know, (laughs) the way I was coaching them, just that was not something that mattered on the women's team. They, they can get just as upset if they feel like I'm, I'm not, effectively coaching their teammate. The second thing I would say is I'm very much about learn how people learn. And there are greater verbal learners on the women's side. Uh, The spoken word can reach more. It doesn't reach all there. There's a percentage where, you know, you have to teach by different methods, but there is a greater section of your team that are very verbal. And so you can, uh, use that with greater impact um, within the team. That That's my feeling. I don't have documentation of that, but I certainly felt that. The beginning point was, was trust. Trust, without question. Trust. Do they trust you? Do they trust that, that, that you have their best interests at heart and the team's? and that you have them in the right order. Um, When I went to Seattle, and I'll just give you an example. The very first player I went to see was a player named Drew Lloyd. And I, you know, took the job. Uh, I went to see Brianna Stewart and and Sue Bird, but their appointments with me were, honestly, Jewel was first. So I fly into uh, Chicago. I, I... have lunch with her. We go to she, her, her number gets retired at her high school. They have a little program. I'm at that, you know, I'm, I'm watching that and what have you. And, and so we begin our relationship together, you know, uh, talking back and forth. And I'll just fast forward, you know, we win a championship in 218. And then in 219, Jules playing marvelously gets hurt. She misses like six weeks of the season. Okay. And is now coming back. And, uh, was an all-star that year and was wanted to get back for the all-star game and, and what have you. So, you know, I think she played one game before the all-star game and what have you, but um, 
she's struggling a little bit as, as often happens after injury, you know, she's not, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a building process. And so I said to her, you know, I, I can't, I feel like we got to build up your minutes. We can't just throw you back on the court with 30 some minutes, you know? So what I'd like to do is bring you off the bench. Well, this is a, an all-star <laughs> This is a player who starts every game and is legitimately a star. And I said, but I'd like to bring you off. And she trusted me. She allowed me to build her minutes up. And then she got back to playing very good. But we had thrown her in expecting her to just be, you know, 100% jewel. And in reality, she had missed enough time. We needed to build it up because sometimes in the seasons, you don't get practice time. You're, you're getting you're, you're, you're playing games by and large, but she trusted me and she allowed me to do that. And that goes back, I think, to, to that trust factor that you have. If that player believes it, that you as, as a coach uh, have their and the team's best interest, and then they'll allow you to do some things that sometimes um, may not be the norm that they're used to, you know, when, especially when they're superstars, you know, in regard to it, but she allowed me to do that. And she has ascended, you know, so many times because I think she allows other, other coaches to have the ability to, to, to get her to some of her best spots. Yes. Yeah. I think all of us have, if, if, if we're really honest with each other. Um, I, I can think and in a lot of cases, it was situations where injuries may have catapulted a young player into a greater role than you than you expect. Um, and I can and I'm not going to name names, but I can I, I can think of them right now. Um, and it eats at me a little bit that I couldn't help them get to that moment faster. Uh, you know, at, 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 at situations, I, I think any, anybody who's really honest is going to tell you yes, because um, it, there's always a little bit of, of, of a, uh, in, inside us as coaches, we are wanting to, it, it, I think if you're really good, it's not always about wins and losses. It's not always about the stats the player has. Are, are, are you hitting, hitting a ceiling of, of, of how good your team can be? Are you hitting a ceiling of how good a player can be? And a lot of times, and maybe most times, you fall a little short. And you have to deal with that, but you keep going. But, uh, yeah, that, that happens, and, and it eats at you. Um, but I think what started to happen with me as I got older was I – I wasn't afraid to try a different way. I, 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 I you know, I, it, it wasn't about me winning an argument with a player that they need to do this. It was a little bit more about me creatively getting them to those positions differently. And I would try a lot of those things as I got older. And, and, and luckily I think in a lot of cases um, I feel very good because relationships are about what it's about. I mean, championships are wonderful. Trust me, and they and they help relationships. But the absolute truth is, as you get older, it's relationships that you had with those players. It, it was that journey you had with them that really ties you and makes you feel worthwhile. Um, it, it, and, and and that's hard unless you've really been in, because you have a position as a coach that is like the highest level of teaching that because they want to be great and you want them to be great. And that's a very unique opportunity uh, to try to have the two work together, you know, to, to get to that. And I don't take that lightly. And so there's a lot of times I felt like I failed, but like I said earlier, you keep going and, and you try to find another way to make it work. I can be very direct and, and normally it, it, it was, it was that it, it, it was that. And um, I also tried to surround 
the player in, in a way that um, I, I when I put together teams, I very rarely put together a team that has very many players that take energy. I, I usually want teams that give energy in their interaction with each other. And even in their interaction with, with me, I mean, there's only so many that I can take who, who kind of take zap energy from you. And so you, you've got, you've got some that maybe are not quite on their own doing it, but if they're surrounded by people that, that do bring a positive energy, a lot of times that brings out that side to them. And so that that's one of the, and I think I did a decent job of that. I just would not, uh, I, I asked myself two questions when we talked about adding players to the team. I, 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 like earlier I said, you know, talent is important. What talent are they bringing? What, what are they going to do that is going to add to this team from a basketball standpoint, from an athletic, st- whatever. But the second thing, was, are they a good teammate? And I, I needed to say yes to both. I, I really did. And whatever decisions I made that probably weren't good, it's because I thought that I could make them good teammates. And, and, and in reality, that that was not their lane. Uh, so I needed to say yes to both of those. When And, and, and mostly I put together teams that way. I think in some cases, it, it, it's a matter of just being alert to watch for that, uh, being able to find a moment to communicate, uh, you're going to be okay. I mean, I had an awful lot of players that were really self-motivated. Again, I was very driven to those kinds of players, uh, players that really put a lot of pressure on themselves. You know, in a lot of cases, my coaching was, Hey, you're going to be okay. Not, you know, get with it. You know, uh, I just was really attracted to people who were kind of hard on themselves in ways. And my job was to kind of give them a, the ability to, uh, uh, healthy move through the fact that they were driven personalities in regard to it. And, and in some cases, uh, <clears throat> allowing them to have an audience with me where they vented. <laughs> I, know, I know nobody likes to really think about that, but there have been more than one times where uh, I felt it was effective that that player basically just had the ability, we had the ability to, uh, for her to find a way to vent in a healthy way and then move on because I had a lot of very driven, very intelligent, players perform for me over the years. Great players have the ability to uh, ascend in moments that um, are very pivotal. They, you get the best version of them in those moments and they, they welcome those moments. They welcome them. They, uh, uh, and I, I've been fortunate to have been around some of them that just amazed me. I, I, I never worried <laughs> about where they were going to be for that game because I, I knew they, they, they would have the discipline. They'd have the self-motivation. They'd have all those things. And that separates, I think, a good player from a great player. They, those moments, and, and usually they're high pressure and usually they're, in, they're, they, they didn't mind uh, taking the shot that was going to win or lose a game. They didn't mind stepping to the free throw line, uh, you know, at those situations. Uh, I coached Becky Hammond, who uh, I think is going to be the first NBA head coach. Uh, I coached her eight years. I, I, I swear she never missed a – you know, and, and I got her, you know – to seek the ball all the time when we're ahead by one, two points late, clock's running down, they're going to foul somebody. I mean, for eight years, I watched her walk to that line and and make that free throw to the point that uh, 
it, it almost defies even uh, just probability of, of it happening once in a while. Uh, but she was so confident in those moments in her skill and, and in her that, I, I mean, I would sit on the bench and literally w- would have been floored if she missed it because those were moments that she saw herself in this way. And, and she was just literally amazing. And I, I won a, a ton of games, uh, just because she would get to the line, make free throws, and we'd close the game out. I think you speak of reality in, in certain situations. And, and, and in those, um, I think I tried to have a presence that allowed space for them to deal with that fact. Uh, and then at the appropriate time, just have a small usually um, adjustment or a small addition that that brought an air of confidence to things. Uh, So you give them space, you watch it. And then if you feel like, okay, maybe I need to say something here, you might, you know, I'll just give you an example. If if they're just not making shots, for example, and they're dealing with that, uh, this is just an example. You know, you might come out of the huddle and just say, you know, hey, make make sure you get a really good knee bend. If you do that, you are everything else is just going to follow through. And sometimes that was the strategy that I used. And it, but a lot of times, I just gave them space and allowed them to work it out. And usually, the ones that are great, they they have that that persistence I'm talking about, and and they're going to keep working at it too. But if I could figure out a way to get them, uh, their mind, maybe they might be so driven to a single point that I needed them to have peripheral vision of the whole situation. I might try to do that, but that that's not an easy thing for a coach. And in some cases you got to allow the player just to work through it. Well, day one, day one, when I, Uh, spoke to the team every year, day one, I would say to them, I'm going, you know, we're going, we, because it's me and the staff and just how we do things. We are going to coach every player, whether you're the best player or you're the 12th player with the same vigor, with the same intensity. Okay. Um, Because, and it goes back, I think, to, to something I saw. I, I, I think the women's teams I had, they wanted that. They, they wanted that teammate to, for me to be coaching them with the same vigor that I did my best players. And I told them on day one we were going to do that. Now, I also told them that doesn't mean you're going to play the same. That doesn't mean your role is the same. Okay. But going back to me being a very average player and, and a lot of things, uh, I, in most cases, worked really hard to allow the team to understand how different roles were important and not just the great ones, but the other roles, you know, being a good teammate, finding a moment. I mean, I, I would celebrate probably more when somebody came in the game that maybe didn't typically do a game after game and did something that, that made a difference to us or how um, things were empowered. Um, I love telling the story that uh, when we won the championship 218, we're in a, in a deciding game with Phoenix and uh, we're struggling. You know, we're not getting a hold of this game. I mean, we're down in third quarter and, and, and now I'm like, okay, coach, Dan, you need to do something because this doesn't seem to be lining up. And so I, I, I brought a player off the bench much earlier than normal. And as a matter of fact, when I walked down, I said, you're in. And she looked at me and she goes, and I go, yeah, you're in. <laughs> and anyway, the player that I uh, took out of the game a little, little earlier than normal was a great player, but that substitution somehow spurred 
you know, that this, this player started making threes. Her name was Sam, Sammy Whitcomb was the name of the player. And we started to ascend. And I'm, I'm watching it kind of go. And, well, I'm going to ride that for a while. So I'm not necessarily bringing the other player back in. And I walked down the bench. And the player that I had taken out looks at me and, and says, hey, coach, Sammy's doing great. Let her go. Well, that is a moment where I knew we were going to win a championship. That moment. And I tell people that and I tell the team that. And I, and I, there, there's, there's just times where uh, you try to identify, identify um, an action, uh, a role that was selfless, that made us a better team. In, in ways that those of us who understand team concepts really work. And uh, I tell that story all the time. And, and, and um, that player that the next game we played that I didn't, she, she was incredibly dominant. So there was nothing but a healthy pursuit of trying to win a championship. I see a trend where people are not necessarily uh, – involved with each other over longer periods that people seem to want to move on. They, 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 they want uh, attention in, in a different new kind of way. I, I see it collegiately. I, I, I see it professionally. Uh, and, and I'm here to tell you some of the long-term relationships are some of the grandest moments. And I worry about that. I, I, I worry that, People can't work together long enough to really create something special because there is this feeling, well, we got to, uh, I want something new, you know, and, 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 and often not because there's something wrong with where they're at. It's just, I want something new. And that's not always, you know, I, I, I understand change and I study change. But I also think that that change needs to be called for in some cases. And I worry about that. I, I, I worry that people are not going to work together long enough to really bring out the best uh, with each other, whether it's teammate to teammate or whether it's coach to teammate. Um, and I worry about and I certainly worry about that in college with younger players, uh, you know, because sometimes that's a process with younger players that, that, that both of them need to be involved in to help really ascend that player to their best. And I'm feeling like that's getting harder and harder. You have to have a philosophy that uh, doesn't really allow for that growth. And that's too bad because sometimes that growth is the only way that it's really going to work. I would play less games. I, I, I would allow, uh, and I live in a world where some of my players played all year round. I would allow more time for practice, for uh, development, and, and not just be game, 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 game. I, I, I don't see it like baseball. Uh, I, I, I see basketball. I, I understand, you know, you might want to play every other day. Or you might want to do that. But I, I, I don't like back-to-backs. I don't like three games in five days and things like that, whether it's the WNBA or the NBA, I, I, I would have less games. <laughs> and uh, I know that's not a great financial model for people trying to make money uh, out of that. And I probably shouldn't say that as a pro coach, but, but that's, that's one of the things I would do. I, I would allow players' bodies to be uh, not as, as a, as attack because of game after game, I'd, I'd allow more time for recovery. I'd allow more time for like that. Um, I think that would, you see, you would see less, I think, uh, overuse injuries and things like that, that I, I'm, I'm very sad when I see those happen in professional sports. I would empower former women's players. I'd like to see them take over, uh, more of, of an ascension to uh, finish their careers and be coaches. It, 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 it is really, uh, I think it's important that 
that they find a path to, to transcend from their playing days into coaching days. And, and, and that can be true in, in a lot of ways. Uh, um, and it, it maybe not even a professional athlete, just, I, I would love to see women uh, enjoy the fruits of, of being coaches. Um, there's no reason why they can't be tremendous coaches. And a lot of times, uh, sometimes players are given that because they're, they were great players and they have names and what have you, but even the average players like, like, like this guy. Uh, but that, that's one I'd like to see. The, the other thing to me is, is understanding uh, the teaching aspect of, of what we do and how fruitful that can be. And so, instead of just studying on the game, you study on, on ways to connect and that, 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 that be part of your journey, because I think that's incredibly important. I, I, there, there are a lot of coaches that are brilliant, absolutely brilliant, but the real measure is not necessarily what, you know, it's, it's what does your player know? And so the ability to take some of that brilliance to them or allow them to develop their own brilliance, that's the essence to me. I would center a little more in where I'm at and not be so driven to what's the next job that, that, that you're going to have. And I, and I think I was okay at that, but I, I, I would literally... Uh, Understand we all have different journeys. We all do. And, and, and opportunities are going to come to some of us earlier than others because they didn't come to me necessarily early. They really didn't. Um, and, and I would a lot later is sometimes greater. And, 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 and I would say that to the young Dan, like, how cool is it that, that I'm 66 and, and, I, and I coached in an Olympics, you know, that's pretty cool, you know, but it, 26, uh, I was like not very patient, <laughs> to be honest with you, about that. But I, but I would tell the young Dan that one. And the other thing that, that I would tell him is, is what eventually happened. And I give, I give my wife some credit. Uh, the change you know, for, for, for a greater, um, opportunity it, is worth it. it. It's okay to change. It's okay to grow. It's okay to do those things, you know? Um, uh, and matter of fact, I think it's healthy. And I, 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 I would tell the young Dan that because uh, the young Dan was probably one frustrated and two, was really driven that you got to do it this way. You got to do it this way. And there's something to that, you know, but there's also something to understanding that uh, maybe this path didn't get me where I'm going, but if I did this one, it might've been better. And I'd be more open to looking for that even earlier in my career. Not, not, not many. Um, sometimes the path that I think uh, was laid out for me, I resisted along the way. I mean, I'm like, no, no, I don't think that's right for me. Um, and and I, I was being led in a certain way. And finally, you know, after, you know, several kind of, uh, opportunities, I, I took that path, but I probably would have, would have, you know, been in, you know, wanted myself to be in the moment and, and ascend to, to that opportunity, uh, earlier. And I, and I, in some cases I fought it, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I, uh, but I, I don't have very many regrets to be honest with you. I, I, I really, really don't. I, I think what happened in my life, allowed me to learn a great, 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 great deal. Okay. Um, and I, I, I learned how to win and I also learned how to lose. 
and I learned from great people. Um, I also learned in some situations that there's an unhealthiness in, in some cases that you gotta, you gotta work around. Um, I would, really wouldn't change a lot uh, because I think that that journey taught me and, it, and that's what I ended up doing at the end of my career was very much talking about, are you paying attention to your journey? Whether you're a, a team in a season or whether you're an individual, are you paying attention to it? Because in a lot of cases, it's teaching you, you know, where your thoughts and efforts should be if you just will pay attention to that journey. I've had several. Um, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, championships uh, are very proud. Uh, watching uh, this, this, the other one is, is, is watching people that you have coached or worked with you ascend and have success. Those just light me up, just light me up. I mean, most of my evenings are spent now watching my assistants, which I, I've got five of them that, that are head coaches now uh, and, and others in other positions. Um, watching their lives play out, it's priceless. I mean, priceless. Um, it gives me a meaning to to watch them ascend in their careers and that's priceless and that and that takes that 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 takes a very very big part in my life along the championships you remember because you you ascend to to the being the best you can be or your gold medals or what have you but watching people you worked with also have success in their life and and not just in their lives professionally but in their lives raising children and doing things like that. It's amazing how that, that I almost feel guilty because I feel like I get more out of it than, than, than they do. But it, it is an incredibly uh, meaningful part of a long career. My favorite movie is To Sir With Love. And everybody in the world should check it out because it's about a teacher and it's about uh, a lot of things to serve with love. No question. My favorite movie uh, TV series. Now that's a really, really, really good one. Um, I loved mash and, and watched that a, a great, great deal. Uh, I love big bang theory. Uh, <laughs> I loved uh, uh, Batman. I mean, I could go all over the board. I don't know if I have a favorite, but you just heard from from three of them that uh, and 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 just a little tidbit. Uh, Get smart. I I watch an episode of Get Smart every day at lunch. I take a break from my work and I watch an episode of Get Smart. And uh, the thing that's so beautiful about Get Smart, and it's just a personal thing. I, I drafted a player named Penny Taylor. Penny Taylor was a great Australian player. Uh, I drafted her at 19 and she went on to a great, great career, played for me and then moved on to Phoenix and had a great career at Phoenix, what have you. But um, I would get VHS tapes. Now that, you know, she, she, she laughs. She sent out a VHS tape. Okay. That showed her as a, as a young Australian and playing. And I, I, it caught my eye. But what also caught my eye, and she sent me several of these tapes, was the games were on TV in Australia, but right after the game, Get Smart was on, which was a, a, an American TV show. And I'd always watch Penny, but then I'd hang around and, and just hope that Get Smart was on. And so uh, uh, my daughter went out and bought me the Get Smart collection, and I'm on season four right now. But th th that there, there, there's a more than I probably should have talked about with TV shows. Wouldn't it be nice uh, by, I vacillate between three. Wouldn't it be nice by the Beach Boys? Uh, a good feeling to know by Poco. 
and, and thirdly, blue collar man, which is by by sticks. Those three, I, I play every day. Somewhere, somehow, those three are played every day, and it it kind of depends. It they move from one to three, all all, all you know in and out all the time. Right now, uh, oh, there's a couple of uh, Sirius XM. I love satellite radio. And the other one that I'm really fascinated by there is one that I had on for a long time, but I didn't use it. it, it, it it's the Holy Bible. It, it allows me in the mornings as I work out to uh, read a chapter of, of uh, the Bible each day, but it, it also talks to me. It, you know, I'll have headphones in and, and it scrolls the sound, but it, 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 it puts the words with it. And somehow there's a greater bit of learning to that. And I truly love satellite radio. So th those apps, without question, get punched every day. Dogs. Cold. get the name of this uh it's a it's a winter sport uh and i actually studied it a little bit uh it's it's where they take the the, the broom and they sweep <laughs> and, and i kind of studied it and I, i'm not quite sure so somehow I, I i but that's that one <laughs> that would be that that would be the most boring sport to me I guess it would be x-ray vision, but it, it, it's not to, because I want to see. I would like to see inside the mind, and, I, and I'm not sure who the who. The, I, I read a lot of comic books, and I know there's some of that where, where people can can get into other people's minds. And I can't think which superhero had that. might have been the villains. I, I, I don't know, but. I would love to get in other people's minds. I, I, I would love to know what the true thoughts are, uh, what's what's being gathered, uh, and I'm trying that. Now, I'm a huge Batman fan, you know, if, you, if you're going to, uh, you know, but I'm not sure he had that, but I love street smart people. I love powers like that. I, I heard Paul McCartney answer this question. Uh, I I would probably say uh, wow that that that's really tough because I'm not I'm not incredibly uh, koala bear. Uh, I'll, I'll go with that one. Okay. Boy, again, a tough, tough question. Uh, I would change it to one of the seasons of the of the year. Um, I, 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 I love things like autumn, summer, spring, whatever. I, um, I, I brought them up to my wife to name our kids, and she vetoed them right away. But. But I, I, I don't know, for some reason, I'm always fascinated by, uh, by names of the, the seasons of the year. I want to be a coach and a teacher, and that, 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 that's, that's been ingrained, and I'm, I'm still that way. You know, I'm still, like, as I move through the next stage of my life, trying to figure out how that, how I'm going to continue to do those things. I may not be doing it as a head basketball coach and in that way, but I want to coach people. I want to teach people. I want to empower people. So I get the joy. And this is a selfish thing of watching them get better. That, that is the essence of, and that, that hasn't changed not one bit in all these years. I like to talk about music. I really wish I could have in-depth conversations with people about music, not necessarily the technical part, the, the enjoyment of music. Um, I, I wish more people would ask me more questions about it. And some do, because they know I have a love of it. But 
like my wife and I, every day of the week, you know, Sundays are gospel in church. Monday are, are Motown, you know, black artists and a study of that. Tuesdays are country or folk kind of music. Wednesdays are women, just studying women artists. Thursday is orchestra or classical, you know, and then, then we do rock and roll on Friday and Saturday or what have you. But I wish people would talk to me about that because I could talk for hours and have all kinds of stories and things because of that fascination. But mostly they talk to me about basketball or coaching, which is, which is fine. But someday somebody's going to give me like an hour just to talk on music and that will be a highlight. It, it's a new world for coaches. It, it's different and it's changing. And um, you have to have the ability to get into the realities of, of the world as it is now. You know, some of the world that I knew, that's, that's, that's not what you're going to be dealing with. That, you know, the, the opportunities are different. The uh, challenges are different. Um, players are players, but what influences them has changed. And, and, and I, I think you need to, to understand, uh, learn from the past, but be in the present, be very much in the present and understanding how, how to be successful in the world we have right now, because that's not quite the world I had to be successful in and it's changing. And that's, that change is okay. Don't, don't run away and say it's a bad profession. Just understand what you have to be to be successful now and how you have to, to, to bring out the best in. Because people are people, you know, but the things that influence them change in our life. And so you need to be aware of how to be effective today, not, not necessarily the world I lived in.